This is Masterboard Theater, and I'm your host, Miss Darling. In this episode, we'll be discussing the life of artist Jean-Michel Basquiat. Jean-Michel Basquiat was born on December 22, 1960, in Park Slope, Brooklyn, as the second of four children to Matilde and Gerard Basquiat. His older brother, Max, died shortly before his arrival, but he has two younger sisters, Lizane and Janine. His father was born in Port-au-Prince, Haiti, and his mother was born in Brooklyn to parents of Puerto Rican descent. He was raised Catholic. Matilde instilled a love for art in her young son by taking him to local art museums and enrolling him as a junior member of the Brooklyn Museum of Art. Basquiat was a precocious child who learned how to read and write by the age of four. His mother encouraged her son's artistic talent and he often tried to draw his favorite cartoons. In 1967, he started attending St. Anne's School, an arts-oriented, exclusive private school, and there he met his friend Mark Prozo, and together they created a children's book written by Basquiat at the age of seven and illustrated by Prozo. That same year, Basquiat was hit by a car while playing in the street. His arm was broken and he suffered several internal injuries eventually needing surgery. While he was hospitalized, his mother bought him a copy of Gray's Anatomy to keep him occupied. After his parents separated that year, Basquiat and his sisters were raised by their father. His mother was committed to a psychiatric hospital when he was 10 and thereafter spent her life in and out of institutions. By the age of 11, Basquiat was fully fluent in French, Spanish, and English, and an avid reader of all three languages. His family resided in the Brooklyn neighborhood of Borum Hill, and then in 1974 they moved to Miramar, Puerto Rico. Due to his mother's instability and family unrest, Basquiat ran away from home at 15 after they had returned to the United States. He slept on park benches in Washington Square Park and was arrested, then returned to the care of his father within a week. He left Edward R. Murrell High School in the 10th grade and then attended City as School, an alternative high school in Manhattan home to many artistic students who failed at conventional schooling. Samo, which means same old, marked the witty sayings of a precocious and worldly teenage mind that even at that early juncture saw the world in shades of gray, fearlessly juxtaposing corporate commodity structures with the social milieu he wished to enter the predominantly white art world. In May 1978, Basquiat and his schoolmate Al Diaz began spray painting graffiti on buildings in Lower Manhattan. Working under the pseudonym Same Old, they inscribed poetic and satirical advertising slogans such as Same Old as an alternative to God. In June 1978, he was expelled from City as School for pieing the principal. And then at the age of 17, his father kicked him out of the house after he decided to drop out of school altogether. He then worked for the Unique Clothing Warehouse at 718 Broadway in NoHo while continuing to write graffiti at night. Then on December 11, 1978, The Village Voice published an article about the Samo graffiti. The next year, Basquiat appeared on the live public access television show, TV Party, 
hosted by Glenn O'Brien. Basquiat and O'Brien formed a friendship, and he made regular appearances on the show after the first few years. Eventually, Basquiat began spending time writing graffiti around the School of Visual Arts, where he befriended students John Sex, Kenny Scharf, and Keith Herring. And in April of that year, he met Michael Holman at the Canal Zone party, and they founded the noise rock band Test Pattern, which was later renamed Gray. Other members of Gray included Shannon Dawson, Nick Taylor, Wayne Clifford, and Vincent Gallio. The band performed at nightclubs such as Max Kansas City, CBGB, Hurrah, and the Mud Club. Around this time, Basquiat lived in the East Village with his friend Alexis Adler, a Barnard biology graduate. He often copied diagrams of chemical compounds borrowed from Adler's science textbooks. She documented Basquiat's creative explorations as he transformed the floors, walls, doors, and furniture into his artworks. He also made postcards with his friend Jennifer Stein. And while selling postcards in Soho, he spotted Andy Warhol at a restaurant and sold Warhol a postcard titled Stupid Games, Bad Ideas. In October 1979, at an open space called A's, Basquiat showed his Samo montages using color Xerox copies of his works. The owner allowed him to use the space to create his man-made clothing, which were painted, upcycled garments. And in 1979 of November, a costume designer, Patricia Field, carried his clothing line in her upscale boutique on 8th Avenue in the East Village. After Basquiat and Diaz had a falling out, Basquiat inscribed, Samo is dead, on the walls of Soho buildings in 1980. And that same year, he appeared in High Times Magazine, his first national publication as part of an article titled, Graffiti 80, the State of the Outlaw Art by Glenn O'Brien. Later that year, he began filming O'Brien's independent film, Downtown 81, originally titled New York Beat. The film featured some of Gray's recordings on its soundtrack. Eventually, he began to be noticed by various critics and curators, including Jeffrey Deitch, who mentioned Basquiat in an article titled Report from Times Square. In February 1981, he participated in the New York New Wave exhibition curated by Diego Cortez at New York's MoMA PS1. Italian artist Sandro Chia recommended his work to the Italian dealer Emilio Mazzoli who promptly bought 10 paintings for Basquiat to have a show in his gallery in Italy. And in December 1981, art critic René Ricard published The Radiant Child in Art Forum magazine, the first extensive article on Basquiat. During this period, Basquiat painted many pieces on objects he found in the streets even on discarded doors. He sold his first painting, Cadillac Moon, in 1981 to Debbie Harry, lead singer of the punk rock band Blondie, for $200. They had filmed Downtown 81 together. At the time, Basquiat was living with his girlfriend, Suzanne Malak, who financially supported him working as a waitress. She later described his sexuality as, quote, not monochromatic. It did not rely on visual stimulation, such as a pretty girl. It was a very rich, multichromatic sexuality. 
He was attracted to people for all different reasons. They could be boys, girls, thin, fat, pretty, ugly. It was, I think, driven by intelligence. He was attracted to intelligence more than anything and to pain. By 1982, at 21 years of age, Basquiat became the youngest artist to ever take part in Documenta in Germany, where his works were exhibited alongside Andy Warhol. Bischkoffberger gave Basquiat a one-man show in his Zurich gallery in September of that year, and he arranged for Basquiat to meet Warhol for lunch on October 4, 1982. Warhol recalled that Basquiat, quote, went home and within two hours a painting was back, still wet, of him and me together, unquote. The painting Das Cabizas ignited a friendship between the two of them. In December 1982, Basquiat began working from the ground floor display and studio space of art dealer Larry Gassonian had built in his Venice, California home. He commenced a series of paintings for a March 1983 show, his second at the Gossonian Gallery in West Hollywood. He was accompanied by his girlfriend, then unknown singer Madonna. Gossonian recalled, quote, everything was going along fine. Jean-Michel was making paintings, I was selling them, and we were having a lot of fun. But then one day Jean-Michel said, my girlfriend is coming to stay with me. So I said, well, what's she like? And he said, her name is Madonna, and she's going to be huge. I'll never forget that he said that. In March 1983, at 22 years of age, Basquiat became the youngest artist to participate in the Whitney Biennial Exhibition of Contemporary Art. That summer, he invited Lee Jaffe, a former musician in Bob Marley's band, to join him on a trip through Asia and Europe. Upon his return to New York, he was deeply affected by the death of Michael Stewart, an aspiring black artist in the downtown club scene who was killed by transit police in September 1983. He painted Defacement, the Death of Michael Stewart, in response to the incident. Basquiat also participated in a Christmas benefit with various New York artists for the family of Michael Stewart. And in May 1984, he had his first show at the Mary Boone Gallery in Soho. A large number of photographs depict a collaboration between Warhol and Basquiat in 1984 and 85. When they collaborated, Warhol would start with something very concrete or a recognizable image and then Basquiat would deface it in his animated style. They made an homage to the 1984 Summer Olympics. Other collaborations included Taxi, 45th Broadway, and Zenith. Their joint exhibition paintings at the Tony Shafrazi Gallery caused a riff in their friendship after it was panned by critics and Basquiat was called Warhol's mascot. In the last 18 months of his life, Basquiat became something of a recluse. His continued drug use is thought to have been a way of coping after the death of Andy Warhol in February 1987. And in January of 88, Basquiat traveled to Paris for his exhibition at the Yvon Lambert Gallery and to Dusseldorf for an exhibition at the Hans Meyer Gallery. Despite attempts at sobriety, Basquiat died at 27 years old of a heroin overdose at his home on Great Jones Street in Manhattan on August 12, 1988. He had been found unresponsive in his bedroom by his girlfriend, K. 
Kelly Inman and was taken to Cabrini Medical Center where he was pronounced dead on arrival. He is buried at Brooklyn's Greenwood Cemetery. A private funeral was held at Frank E. Campbell Funeral Chapel on August 17, 1988. The funeral was attended by immediate family and close friends, including Keith Herring, Francesco Clemente, Glenn O'Brien, and Basquiat's former girlfriend, Paige Powell. Art dealer Jeffrey Deitch delivered a eulogy. In memory of the late artist, Keith Herring created the painting A Pile of Crowns for Jean-Michel Basquiat. In the obituary he wrote for Vogue, Herring stated, quote, He truly created a lifetime of works in ten years. Greedily we wondered what else he might have created, what masterpieces we have been cheated out of by his death. But the fact is that he has created enough work to intrigue generations to come. Only now will people begin to understand the magnitude of his contributions. Shortly after his death, the New York Times indicated that Basquiat was, quote, the most famous of only a small number of young black artists who have achieved national recognition, unquote. Traditionally, the interpretation of Basquiat's works at the visual level comes from the subdued emotional tone of what they represent compared to what is actually depicted. For example, the figures in his paintings, as stated by writer Stephen Metcalf, quote, are shown frontally with little or no depth of field, and nerves and organs are exposed, as in an anatomy textbook. Are these creatures dead and being clinically dissected, one wonders, or alive and in immense pain? Unquote. Musician David Bowie was a collector of Basquiat's works, stated, quote, He seemed to digest the frenetic flow of passing image and experience, put them through some kind of internal reorganization, and dress the canvas with this resultant network of chance, unquote. In the words of one art historian, he, quote, paints like a child. Don't paint what is on the surface. Finally, every energy you drop is marking a territory, is a traffic sign, is directing and feeding spirits. What seems like a mess for some of us in the Cartesian logic, it is maybe a clear spiritual route for some others." Unquote. Reviews about his work have been written on the direct relation of painting and graffiti. Writer Olivia Lang stated, quote, Words jumped out at him from the back of cereal boxes or subway ads, and he stayed alert to their subversive properties, their double and hidden meaning, unquote. Another art critic, Rene Ricard, wrote, quote, I'm always amazed at how people come up with things, like Jean-Michel. How did he come up with the words he puts all over everything, his way of making a point without overstating the case? Using one or two words, he reveals a political acuity, gets the viewer going in the direction he wants, the illusion of the bombed over wall. One or two words containing a full body, one or two words on a Jean-Michel contain the entire history of graffiti. What he incorporates into his pictures, whether found or made, is specific and selective. He has a perfect idea of what he's getting across, using everything that collates to his vision." Unquote. Since Basquiat's death in 1988, the market for his work has developed steadily in line with overall art market trends, with a dramatic peak in 2007 when, at the height of the art market boom, the global auction volume for his work was over $115 million. 
In 2002, Basquiat's Prophet was sold at Christie's by drummer Lars Ulrich of the heavy metal band Metallica for $5.5 million. The proceedings of the auction were documented in the 2004 film Metallica, Some Kind of Monster. In June 2002, New York con artist Alfredo Martinez was charged by the Federal Bureau of Investigation with attempting to deceive two art dealers by selling them $185,000 worth of fake Basquiat drawings. The charges against Martinez landed him in Manhattan's Metropolitan Correction Center for 21 months involved a scheme to sell drawings he copied from authentic artworks accompanied by forged certificates of authenticity. Martinez claimed he got away with selling fake Basquiat drawings for 18 years. In 2007, Basquiat's painting Hannibal was seized by federal authorities as part of the embezzlement scheme by convicted Brazilian money launderer and former banker Edmar Cid Ferreira. Ferreira had purchased the painting with illegally acquired funds while he controlled Banco Santos in Brazil. It was shipped to a Manhattan warehouse via the Netherlands with a false shipping invoice stating it was worth $100. The painting was later sold at Sotheby's for $13.1 million. Between 2007 and 2012, the price of Basquiat's work continued to steadily increase, up to $16.3 million. The sale of Untitled was $20 million in 2012 and elevated his market to a new stratosphere. Soon other works outpaced that record. Another work, Untitled, 1981, depicting a fisherman sold for $26.4 million in November of 2012. 2013, Dust Heads, sold for $48.8 million at Christie's in May of 2016. In May 2017, Maezawa purchased Basquiat's Untitled 1982, a powerful depiction of a black skull with red and yellow rivulets, at auction for a record-setting $110.5 million. It is the most ever paid for an American artwork and the sixth most expensive artwork sold at an auction, surpassing Andy Warhol's Silver Car Crash Double Disaster, which sold for $105 million in 2013. Maezawa's two record-breaking purchases of Basquiat's artworks total nearly $170 million. In the words of curator Mark Mayer in the 2005 essay Basquiat in History, he wrote, Basquiat speaks articulately while dodging the full impact of clarity like a matador. We can read his pictures without strenuous effort, the words, the images, the colors, and the construction, but we cannot quite fathom the point they belabor. Keeping us in this state of half-knowing, of mystery within familiarity had been the core of technique of his brand of communication since his adolescent days as the graffiti poet Samo. To enjoy them, we are not meant to analyze the pictures too carefully. Quantifying the encyclopedic breadth of his research certainly results in an interesting inventory, but the sum cannot adequately explain his pictures he painted a calculated incoherence, calibrating the mystery of what such apparently meaning-laden pictures might ultimately mean. But not everybody was a fan. In a review for The Telegraph, art critic 
Hilton Kramer begins his first paragraph by stating that Basquiat had no idea what the word quality meant. The criticisms which follow relentlessly label Basquiat as a, quote, talentless hustler, unquote, and, quote, street smart, but otherwise invincibly ignorant, unquote, arguing that art dealers of the time were, quote, as ignorant about art as Basquiat himself. In saying that Basquiat's work never rose above that lowly artistic station of graffiti, even when his paintings were fetching enormous prices, Kramer argued that graffiti art acquired a cult status in certain New York art circles. Kramer further opined that, as a result of the campaign waged by these art world entrepreneurs on Basquiat's behalf and their own, of course, there was never any doubt that the museums, the collectors, and the media would fall into line when talking about the marketing of Basquiat's name. So what do you think? I have my opinions, but I'm just an old gal on the internet. Thank you for being here. Join us again for another episode of Masterboard Theatre.